I want to join with CW in welcoming the visitors, especially those who've come thousands of miles. I know you came just to be here tonight. We're glad to have visitors, whatever brings them to the area or to our assembly, whether it's from the local community, whether it's from some distance away, whether it's one who is interested in working with us as a congregation or one who is just passing through. It's always encouraging when people take time to worship together and for us to get to meet new brothers and sisters in Christ and, and to see those that are interested in spiritual things. We hope you'll feel free to ask any questions you may have about things that we discuss as well as what we do as a congregation, whichever is most applicable to you. On the second Sunday night of the month, I've kind of made a somewhat of a habit, not completely consistently, but I try to include some song in the lesson. And I want to look at number 622. If you'll open your songbook to that, that song, you can kind of just keep that open along with your Bible to follow along in some of the points that we're going to look at this evening. And this is a song written by Fanny J. Crosby. She's one of, uh, is one of the many songs that she's written that, that are uh, very popular songs among our brethren. In fact, you can look back in the back of this particular songbook, and the, um, the author's is one of the indexes that's back there. I guess indices might be the more proper way to say that. But uh, there is actually the list of all the authors. And if you look at Fanny J. Crosby, it says she, meant she was, lived from 1820 to 1915. And you can just see the long list of songs that she wrote. And uh, I don't know a whole lot about her, but I know something about her from the kind of songs she wrote. And she was, from what I understand, she was blind. She, and that, that, I have a tender spot for blind people because my uncle, I have an uncle that was born blind. And we'd go to visit him and I was always fascinated with his ability to do amazing things with, as a blind man. One of the things he would often say if you had something, um, I, I did some leather work for a while, you know, made belts and wallets and things. And uh, one time he was asked, I was telling him about, you know, kind of, hey, John, what are you doing? He called me John John, but y'all don't need to know that. But um, he said, what you doing? What you doing? I'm working on this. He said, he said let me see it. He wanted to see it. Well, to see it for him, he would take it and he would feel it, you know. And, and that was something he could feel. It had a texture to it. But I've also noticed that in the songs that Fanny J. Crosby wrote, often she would include references to seeing things. It's also true in this song. And obviously has a spiritual meaning in, this, in these verses. I'll, I'll leave it for you to find it. I may point it out, but you'll probably find it ahead of time as we're going through what, he's say, what she's saying in this song. But I want to look at the context of this, of this song or, the, or the, excuse me, the text of this song, the words of this song. That First of all, beginning with the title, tell me the story of Jesus. And I want to make a statement about the word story. I know that some people might think of a story just as being something made up. In fact, that was a term when I was growing up, if somebody was asking, if my mother was asking you if you're telling the truth, she'd say, are you telling a story? <laughs> and that's not what we mean by a story like that. We, we mean the story in the sense of it being something that's retold. And in fact, there are sometimes you'll watch a TV program or something else and it says, this is a true story. You know, it is a true story. This is something that really happened. And that's certainly the way we need to look at that as it's used in this, in this song. And the very title of the song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus, as that is the title that is given of this song. That should be 622. I don't know who put 632 on there. Um, 622. Tell me the story of Jesus. And I just want you to think about that phrase for a moment to, as we consider singing this song in... Let me raise your hand if you know the song. Very few people don't know the song. Okay. You'll know it. You'll know it before we finish. Okay. But, but the, the idea of tell me the story of Jesus is, is written from one who knows this. They know what happened to Jesus, but they're asking for it to be told to them. It should be a story that we're never tired of hearing. It should also be a story that we're very familiar with, as is brought out in this, that we can tell it. 
And, and many times as we think about what it is to spread the gospel and we, we get into technicalities about how we approach people, do you realize how much of it can just be accomplished by telling the story of Jesus? And we begin with some of the things and we're just going to kind of follow the verses through as, as this is mentioned. Notice the next phrase. Tell me the story of Jesus right on my heart every word. That, that's not just saying put it in my mind. He's saying, write it on my heart. I want you to notice in, from the book of Hebrews, there's a quotation. It actually comes from, it's Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. But it's a quotation from Jeremiah 31, anticipating the time that, of this new covenant that God would have with His people. It's written during a time when there were many of the Israelites, the chosen people of God, that had turned away in their heart from God even in a time when they'd had a king named Josiah that had brought many of them back in practice to doing what God wanted. But just like what Isaiah said in a previous time, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in that occasion, as Jeremiah is talking about it, he says they've returned to me only feignedly or pretendingly, but not with a whole heart. So in anticipation of the new coming covenant with his people that would include be inclusive of all peoples in Jer in Hebrews chapter 8 as he's as he's uh, quoting this particular passage from Jeremiah chapter 31 it begins in verse 8 we says finding fault with him he says behold the days are coming says the Lord then when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall, and they shall be my people. Now think about that terminology. That God is anticipating a time that His Word will be written on their heart. That is, it's not just academic knowledge. It's not just learning information. It's having it sincerely in our hearts in what we believe. It, is, it, is, uh, it implies that devotion that we have. It is the fulfillment of so much of what Psalm 119 is about. That emphasizes how valuable God's Word is and what it can do for us and recognizing that from God. So when, when this song, as we're singing the song, and we will in a few minutes, when we say, write on my heart every word, we, we don't want it to just be superficial. We don't just want it to be something that's on the surface. We want it to be down deep. We want it to be real for us. That it really means something. So many times the Bible emphasizes not just the, the, the shallow understanding of things, but the deeper acceptance and application and sincerity of following what God wants. You, of course, this, verse, this, this scripture goes on to say, they will not teach, None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none shall teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. And that verse, I think, confuses a lot of people. It almost sounds like there's, for everybody, it's just going to be instant knowledge. They're not going to ever learn anything. I think some people take it that way. I don't, I don't believe that is indeed a valid application of it. In fact, what does Romans 10, 17 say? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That, that's how we learn, is, is in hearing and reading God's Word. That's how we learn about Him. But he's describing, really, that... There is a sincerity among God's people. It's not like it was with the Israelites. Here they are. They're, they're God's people before they even know how to talk. They're, they're already, they already have this covenant relationship with God when they're born into this world. And then they have to be taught about God. They have to be taught about the God that they serve. But when we're born into the kingdom, the spiritual rebirth of us becoming a Christian... A prerequisite to that is knowing God. In fact, there's knowing God in the, in the knowledge sense. There's knowing God in the relationship sense that is part of what it is to become a Christian. So all will know me. Look at the difference between the way it was with the Old Testament. The people of Israel were God's people even when they were rebellious. Even when they turned away from Him. There was, there was no purity in His people. But now those that are really His people really do love Him. 
If you don't love God, if you're not sincere about following God, you're not one of His people. It's a, it's a pure nation. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different kind of a covenant as he describes in beginning these verses. And this was written in about, what, 500 and something B.C. And then quoted again in Hebrews chapter 8 in the first century. But it, is an, it was initially in anticipation of it and in application as the Hebrew writer is saying, this is, the, this is the covenant that we have now. And what we have in this, is this what's written on our heart? So we've only gotten through two phrases from the song here. But write on my heart every word. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want this word to be down deep where it's, where it's really a part of you and not just some, I just got some facts memorized. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. I mean, even those words are things that could say, do we really see it as a precious story, as a precious series of events that took place, that it's something that we can really say, these are really precious things, these are really wonderful things that have been done. And it, there is no better story on earth. There may be a lot of things that are told, some true, some false, but even all the true stories, there's nothing more precious and 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 delightful to the soul than what Jesus did as we understand all of what took place. Notice it says in, verse, in the third line of verse 1, Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed His birth. Glory to God at the highest. Peace and good tidings on earth. You know, it's, it's worthy to take time to go through all of the things that are said around the time of the birth of Jesus. Because what it really establishes is, and although I know a lot of people have their Christmas things that they do during that time of year, I would say that a large portion of them, if not a majority of people that have some kind of a Christmas celebration, and supposedly in honoring who Jesus is, even though that was not anything that Jesus set in place, have no idea of the significance of His birth. That Him coming into this world was a fulfillment of prophecies that had been made Many years prior, all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the promises made to Abraham of in your seed all the nations of the earth be blessed. And the things that told about where he would be born and, and, and the time in which he would be born. And, and this anticipation of the world and those that understood it that there's going to be this one who is coming and we would say that in many ways that's the whole theme of the Old Testament. Someone's coming. And then to, then to have it happen. And, and, and what, a, what a wonderful thing that God, as His name means God with us, when His name will be Emmanuel, that's what it means. God with us. Not just saying that God is with us in the sense that He's, he's, he's interested in us, He's aware of us, but Him literally being with us on this earth. That may be hard for some people to believe. It was hard for people then, it's hard for people now. That God could come in the flesh but when we understand what the Bible says about it, the nature of the virgin birth is not just a miracle of birth. It's the miracle of man, of, of Jesus coming as God in the flesh. And there were people in that day that had trouble with it. There are people today that don't believe it's true. They might even, and, and we would say that, you know, rec we recognize, we certainly should recognize that much of the world just sees Jesus, as a good man, he was a good teacher. He was trying to do some good things, and people killed him. I had, a, I had a college professor tell me that one time. And it was just a little community college I went to, and the lady was teaching English. And, and that's the way she presented she, the, the story of Jesus to her was, here was this good guy. He was trying to do good things, and they killed him. <laughs> Almost like, end of story. How sad, right? Not to realize that, in fact, that's what he came to do. But as, as was proclaimed by the angels, and it's some things that maybe we hear so many times that we don't even realize the significance of the last statement that's made by the angels and recorded for us when he says, Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Glory to God in the highest. The highest praise we can give to God that he's brought this plan of salvation to fruition and sending Jesus to this earth. The angels recognized it. They, they recognized it. And even the idea that this birth is being celebrated by the angels is indication that this is so much more significant than any other person, no matter whatever great things they might have accomplished while they were here. But this phrase, peace 
and good tidings on earth. Peace and goodwill toward men. Jesus did not bring harmony and peace among all people. They, did, they weren't all getting along then. They aren't all getting along now. They didn't even all get along with Him. If His purpose was to bring where there was no more conflicts among people, He failed. And I say that only to say that we need to recognize that wasn't the kind of peace that it's talking about. Yes, God wants us to have peace with each other, and certainly among brethren. But it also is true that there's something higher involved here, and that's the peace with God. And that's an absolute, that Jesus came to provide a way for man to have peace with God, being at odds with God because of his sin, having enmity with God because of his sin, Jesus provided a way of us to have peace with God. And that brings about the good tidings. You know, that, that could have been translated gospel on earth. That's what it means. The gospel. It's, it's the good news. And as we think about this good tidings, this, this wonderful message that was one that was not only going to be brought to the Jews, of whom Jesus was one, and of, of whom his apostles were, but it was also a message that was going to all the earth. As was said to Abraham, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It was a, an availability to all people. And, and you see that among some of the people in the day as the apostles are going around and preaching to them and the response that they have. And sometimes it, it came more at times, not entirely. There were times that it was great rejoicing among, among the Jews as well. But you see them going into the Gentile communities where these Gentiles had been left on the outside looking in. They weren't God's people. They were aware of God's people, some of them. But now there can be God's people. They can be part of of this wonderful covenant that Jesus brought and provided for us, and they are absolutely overjoyed. It talks In verse 2, talks about some of the things he did. We know that if you're still in the book of Hebrews, if you back up a few chapters in chapter 4 and verse 14, he says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we're given this in the song here, the reference to him fasting alone in the desert. And let's just read that part of the verse. He says, fasting alone in the desert, this is verse 2 of the song. Tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant of lack at last. Now we know that's both in the sense of the triumph he had, the victory he had over the temptation that he faced when he was in the desert. Matthew chapter 4. When you, we see a number of things here, you might remember there were three very should we say tailored <laughs> temptations given to Jesus? And, and I say that because the temptations that the devil gave to Jesus wouldn't be a temptation to us because we couldn't do it. At least some of them. At least the first two we recognize there's there's a problem with. But but when he's when when it says he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and afterward he was hungry. That's a long fast. Maybe you fasted some. I, in a true, complete fast, I doubt anybody here has gone 40 days. But maybe you also recognize that there's cycles of hunger that can come when somebody is fasting, even in short time. But when you have a really long fast and it's time that you're breaking your fast, it's time to eat, and, and, and it becomes a desperate means of, of your body just longing to have some nourishment 
this is not something to trifle with and say it's not any big deal. When we think about the things that are stated in the book, you don't have to turn over to 1 John 2, but where it talks about all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. In other words, everything that we would say is a temptation can be, can be put into one or more of those categories. There are the things that have to do with the very flesh itself. And while people may think of that in a sexual way and only related to that, there's no stronger physical desire than hunger when it's real. And all of us have had that to one degree. Maybe we think, you know, teenagers, not mentioning any names, <laughs> not quite there yet anyway. You know, when it gets to be mid-afternoon and they haven't eaten since noon, it's like I'm starving to death. And maybe sometimes we've had the same kind of sensation at times. But think about this. Jesus, when it says he was tempted a lot in all points like as we are, he was certainly being tempted with the desire of the flesh. It, was, it wasn't some kind of just imaginary thing. His flesh, his body is hungry. And it's demanding food. And so the devil uses that and says, turn these stones to bread. I said, I said it was tailored to him because the devil could tell us that all we want. We're, we can't turn the stones to bread. He had the ability to do that. He certainly could have done it. But he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The second temptation, he takes him up on top of the pinnacle of the temple. It says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. What's he appealing to here? The pride of life. Who you are. We, we might think about that times when our, our self is challenged. Maybe our, our dignity is challenged and somebody might provoke us to do things to prove our manliness, our womanliness, our humanity, whatever way we want to say it. And we're being challenged in some way to prove who we are. And here's, here's Jesus who came to the earth humbled himself, took the form, as Philippians 2 says, the form of a servant, of a man, and, he, and he's living as a man. He's the creator, and he's living as a man. Isn't that enough? And here's people questioning whether he's who he claims to be. So the devil is saying, if you're really the son of God, do this. And he, is, he even quotes the scriptures, his angels will give his charge over you, verse 6. And in their hands they shall bear you up, Lest, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, I think some of the questions that come up in all of these is why would that have been a sin? And there's one simple answer. And that is because the devil is the one who's trying to get him to do it. But he answers, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, verse 7. So the, so the devil took him up on, on, takes him up on a high, took him, I didn't know that word, t t took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, verse Eight and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, all of these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Now I want us to recognize something here. This was not, a, this was not something that the devil didn't have control over. He had control over most of the people in the world because they'd given him, themselves to him then and now. Part of what he's given him is a shortcut. You want to go through all of that suffering? You want to go through all of Look, just fall down and worship me. I'll give all these people to you. They'll be yours. They're already mine. I'll give them to you. I'll give you a shortcut here. Let me, that, that of course would somewhat relate to some of the previous points of blessed of the flesh, not wanting to go through that, and certainly the pride of life, of establishing, of, of people respecting him for who he is. But it's also what is involved in the lust of the eye. Lust of the eye is possession. I see something, I want to have it. I have my eye on something. You ever use that phrase? About something that you plan on buying? I have my eye on that. I want to possess that thing. And there's a, there's a, there's a desire that is associated with this. And he's saying, I'm going to give you this. And of course, the... the uh, as Jesus responds to this, he says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. 
How many times might that be an answer in these answers that he gives there that we, that we follow the same thing of answering just what we know the scriptures say even in the moment as we're tempted because sometimes our just temptation is also a deception. It doesn't seem that bad what we're being tempted in. We just need to remember what the words of the Bible are, what the words of God are to give us the strength to get through the various things that we face in this life. That verse goes on and says, Tell of the years of his labor. Tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. You know, we think about the position that he took. He didn't, he didn't come to earth and take the position of an earthly king or living in the lap of luxury. He didn't come to this world and demand what he really was deserving of, which was to have everybody serve him, but he came to serve and to provide a way for us to be saved. We also recognize that there were many ways we can take even from the statements that are made about him in the first part of Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? Isaiah 53. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire. And he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as we hid as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did esteem him not. In fact, much of that chapter that describes some of the things that were done to him that were completely undeserved. There was nothing he did to deserve what he went through. He didn't, he didn't deserve to have to live as a man. He didn't deserve to have to go through the suffering that he did. He was deserved and worthy of all praise and glory and honor. But he did these things for us to provide us a way the, th the last verse, tell of the cross when they nailed him. Maybe that's one of those things that even though we sing about it, we think about it with the Lord's Supper, that we don't really want to think about it. Just how gruesome it was. How torturous it was. As, he go as this song goes on and says, writhing in anguish and pain. It was designed to be a very torturous death. It wasn't designed to be a quick form of execution. <laughs> Had it been... Had it been, maybe we wouldn't realize just, just what it was that he was going through for us. But even from the standpoint of various kinds of ways that people were put to death, and, and it was fulfillment of amazing things. You ever think about the way, like in Psalm 22, where it mentions they pierced his, my hands and my feet. That had to be a puzzle to the people reading it in the days of David. Why would they be piercing people's hands and feet? <laughs> well, what's the significance of that? They, had, they, were, they didn't use crucifixion in that day. They, they, by amazing prophecies, that whole chapter of Psalm 22, that, that predicts the things that were happening. The, people, the soldiers gar, gambling over his garments. The spear thrust in his side. All those things that are foretold about what would happen, but not only so. But to realize it was indeed an agonizing death that he did and, and that he went through for us. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. You know, that, that matter of saying, tell of the grave where they laid him, that tomb that is now empty, that should be something that we should be proclaiming. Because realize this, if people are convinced about the resurrection of Christ, everything else falls into place. He is who he said he was. His, his death was for our provision. It was, in fact, that he is risen again. And, and along with that comes the question, well, where is he now? Or even the days afterward, where is he now? That he's exalted to the right hand of God, that he is our king, that he's sitting on that throne, and that he's the one that we need to... If, if you really, let, let me just say it this way. Think about this about yourself. If you really believe that Jesus died and was risen from the dead in the fulfillment of the scriptures and all of those things, how can you not want to follow him? Because that, that's where your hope is. And then it mentions the motive in the last part of that verse. Love in that story so tender. 
And here's the phrase I was telling you to watch for. Clearer than ever, I see. Think about that from a blind person writing that. Stay. Let me weep while you whisper love paid the ransom for me. To realize that it was God's love. That God loves you. You know, think about the song, Jesus Loves Me. We teach to the children, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. He is weak, but we are strong. I mean, I am weak, but he is strong. He said backwards. I mean, recognizing that God loves me. That Jesus loves me. He really does care about me. That is significant. All right, let's sing this song. Tell me the story of Jesus. Number 622. Mm -hmm. Is that the top note? Mm -hmm. Do me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. history, his story. <laughs> What's real history? What's really what happened? <clears throat> Have you heard it? Do you believe that story? Do you believe it to be true? And will you obey? And that brings us not only to do you know his story, but do you know him? 
And I hope that if you don't, you'll take make use of this opportunity. If we can help you becoming a Christian or returning to him, we invite you to come forward.